Good afternoon, everybody, um, and Pinhounda. I'd like to welcome you to NAHT Cymru's update on COVID-19 and the return to school for all pupils in September in Wales and the, the um, guidance which was published yesterday. Unfortunately, the, the Minister of Education, Kirsty Williams, isn't with us right now, but she is going to be joining us as soon as possible. Um, and we also have with us the co-chair of the Technical Advisory Self, Listy Bene. We've got Laura Dole, the director of NAHT Cymru, and Ruth Davis, the president of NAHT. My name is Natalie Pettifer, I'm one of the regional organisers within NAHT and I'm currently covering the uh, Wales and South of England regions. So my purpose for being here this evening is to facilitate the event to make sure that everybody knows how, when they're coming in, how things are running. I can see we've already got nearly 300 of you who've come into the room with us, that's fantastic, we've got nearly 500 people registered for this event. So you'll be able to see at the bottom of your screen that there are a couple of things which you can join in with. There's the chat facility, which you can comment on throughout the broadcast. You can make sure that you um, put your comments to all attendees and then we'll be able to pick up on them. If you have any technical issues, perhaps viewing or hearing, if you can make sure that you um, let us know that my colleague will be on hand to assist you. Any references to any documents, for example, that we're talking about throughout the event, we'll be able to put links in the chat area as well. Some of you have already used the Q&A section and you can add to that as you go on. We've had questions submitted to us already, which will be coming to uh, later on in the broadcast. If you see a question that's in the Q&A and you think, yeah, that's a great question, please vote on it. We're going to be going to the most popular ones after we've gone through the ones which have already been submitted. So hopefully we'll get through as many questions as we can as possible. Um, there will be a recording available as well after we finish um, and that will be on our website. And um, I mustn't forget to add as well, we have the uh, broadcast being simultaneously translated into the Welsh language. So if you are wanting to um, listen to the, to the Welsh language, if you can select at the bottom of your screen, the um, Good to move Chinese with option, option Chinese. Um, and that will be able to mean that you'll be able to then hear the, the translator simultaneously. So I think that's all that I need to say at this point in time. I'd like to bring in Laura Dull, Director of NEHT Comrie. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us again. Uh, it seems a great many things have changed since I last spoke to you. Uh, you've opened your doors on June the 29th to additional children as part of the check-in, catch-up and prepare strategy. And you've embraced that new way of working. With that new way of working, of course, came many challenges. I know that many of you were prepared to work an extended summer term to support your children and were disappointed that you were not able to do that. I know conflicting reports in the media about whose fault for not opening for the additional few days made for very challenging times in school. But I want to assure you that your desire to do all you can to support learners and do everything you can to help them has not gone unnoticed and will not go unnoticed. As we come to July, our focus almost immediately turns to September planning and what to expect in the autumn term. We continue to challenge Welsh Government on producing its plan and guidance as soon as possible to ensure you had all the time you needed to prepare. At the forefront of my mind has always been and continues to be the health and well-being of our members and therefore it was imperative that plans were in place ahead of the summer holidays to give you the much needed break you deserve. At the same time as you were getting into the new rhythm of school life the profession came under intense press and public scrutiny. Uncertainly, uncertainty, unfortunately, breeds anxiety. And as you were all working towards September plans, people who have no understanding of the complexity of returning to school and the strain the profession is under saw fit to publicly criticise school leaders and school staff. Everyone is entitled to an opinion, but not when it attempts to pit school leaders, education professionals, parents and our communities against each other. Such uninformed commentary undermines the profession and the resolve we all share, which is to get as many children back into school as possible and support the people around them who are working tirelessly to deliver for those children. So plans were revealed this week and the guidance is out. We welcome a September return for all pupils and the two week transition period at the beginning of the term to help facilitate the full return. It is also refreshing to see that parents will not be fined for the moment if they choose not to send their children back to school immediately. And that instead, we will all work together to ensure that our safe schools are as safe as possible and create a welcoming environment for parents to willingly send their children back. 
Now, of course, along the way, there have been some challenging conversations with our local authority employers and indeed Welsh Government. Despite not always agreeing on the specifics, the willingness of Welsh Government to engage with the profession means that NAHT is able to put forward your issues and work with officials on this guidance. This relationship, although I admit is strained at times, continues to support you and is why the Minister and Co-Chair of the Technical Advisory SAR has agreed to come and speak with you this afternoon. I want to once again say a huge thank you to you all. Having spoken to many of you over the last few months, through email, text messages, late night phone calls with me and the rest of the Wales team, we've worked together to overcome the great many obstacles you have faced. I know I keep saying it, but we remain immensely proud to represent you all. Time and again, you've demonstrated the dedication, skills and compassion that is synonymous with the education profession in Wales. Our work is by no means done. We still have a long road to the new normal, but through our shared values, and collective approach, NAHT will continue to challenge, strive to make things a little bit easier for you, and most importantly, give you the support that you need to do your job. Hand back over to Natalie now, who's facilitating today's event. Thanks. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, okay, so now what I'd like to say, Obviously, we, we had um, anticipated that Kirsty would be with us, Kirsty Williams would be with us from the start of the broadcast. Uh, she's definitely on her way to join us. So thank you very much to um, Felicity Benet, who's the co-chair of the Technical Advisory Cell. She's um, happy to, to speak to you first regarding the, from the scientific perspective for the, um, the plans. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Laura, and, and thanks, everybody. I'll try to speak up, but just um, let me know if I'm not being heard well enough um, since the beginning of this outbreak, uh, we've been concentrating on the, the, the potential for COVID-19 to be particularly dangerous to children. Um, and it wasn't until really the beginning of last week when we had enough evidence to change our advice to the Minister for Education and the Minister for Health in Wales on whether or not it was safe to uh, advise that schools could go back in greater numbers. Uh, Scientists and technical experts are, are naturally quite shy and, and cautious beasts and we don't like offering false hope. But there were a number of significant studies uh, that completed their peer review. Uh, we had quite a lot of discussion in SAGE and, and the wider um, scientific group for emergencies and there were basically four things that have given us a significant degree of confidence in recommending the approach of being able to get 100% of children and teachers back in physically into schools. The first is the decline in the prevalence of the virus in Wales and our sister nations of Scotland and Ireland and England. In Wales, we're doing thousands of PCR tests a day and with the exception of our testing, if there's an outbreak, there are fewer and fewer cases in the general community. Uh, I took some time to estimate with colleagues in Public Health Wales yesterday and we think there's about 66 new cases a day per million people. So out of the over 3 million people in the whole of Wales, we think there are fewer than 200 new cases a day, which is amazing. Uh, we're also doing reasonable antibody testing. We've tested over 25,000 people in Wales for antibodies that show they've had the virus, including now over 7,000 teachers. And of those, about 5% of the population seem to have had the disease. The antibodies don't guarantee that somebody is immune, it just shows us how many people are likely to have had the disease. So one in 20, um, it's a similar experience in Spain and the serum prevalence for teachers is no different from any other part of the population. The second thing is and the pathogen genomics, the study of the RNA of the virus itself, which is really exciting, and fingerprinting the disease to understand how it's mutating. The UK has sequenced more than 50% of all of the virus samples in the world at this point, and Wales is second only to the Sanger Institute in Cambridge. We found about 2,000 different mutations, most of them don't survive very long. But the one that we have seen surviving over time shows uh, it's easier to transmit but it isn't any more severe and with no evidence of extra severity we think that we've seen uh, for at least the following sort of six months or so the, the worst strains of the virus that we can see 
The third thing, and super important here, is the stronger evidence that children don't transmit or become infected nearly as much as adults do. The COVID-19, the papers we provided for evidence, uh, show that around 600,000 people tested in Spain, uh, only 3% of the children had the virus compared to 5 or 6% of adults. So they seem to have it at about half the, the usual amount. And in fact, although children make up 25% of the global population, they consistently account for less than 2% of the cases, hugely much lower. The final thing is that we have been able to see the co-production of the new school approaches between the government and local authorities and schools and teachers, and to a certain extent even now with children in Wales. And, and there's evidence that the success of this approach is going to depend on behaviour and understanding really as much as it does on the risk assessments and the protocols that we put in place. The success of schools over the next term is really going to depend on the co-production of approaches between staff, pupils and parents, just as much as with the authorities. Everybody needs to understand their responsibility in keeping the infection levels down. That's how people are going to keep each other safe. If we trust each other to keep for them, then we're going to be able to avoid the further general lockdowns that we were forced to go to this time. And with those pieces in place, we felt comfortable to review and to make new recommendations to the minister. And, and I feel comfortable coming and talking to you about them. Um, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to take too much time. And I know most of the time is meant to be taken up with, uh, with talking about questions. So uh, I'll, I'll pause and come back to you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to get us all back here so we can all, all be seen at the moment. Thank you for that, Felicity. Um, what I'd like to do then, if that's okay with you, I know you've had a chance to look through some of the questions which were submitted directly to you um, in advance of the, this afternoon's um, broadcast. So if I could just um, take your attention to there, these actually all came from um, Austin Bowers. The first question, um, uh, directed to you is what does distance learning look like in a foundation phase classroom um, and I think you could link up with that how much acceptable crossover between contact groups so um, the transmission rate with children below the age of 12 is significantly lower uh, a study in the Netherlands showed 0.3 percent uh, zero prevalence in children under the age of 10 compared to a sort of three or 4% average in the adult population. Uh, children between uh, 11 and 18, I think were about 1.3%. So a little higher, although not too much. But the recommendation is that rather than have separate contact groups, we allow whole year groups to mix uh, more freely and concentrate more on hand hygiene and practical things like keeping children facing all in the same direction rather than towards each other. Thank you. Um, and I think we'll go to the next question just while we're waiting. So I'm not sure if um, the minister's ready to join in just yet. So um, if we can come to the next question. Sorry. Right. If we come to the next question for you, Felicity, um, this kind of builds on the same theme. It's about contact. Uh, contact. What is an acceptable level level of mixing between class groups, and how much mixing of contact groups can happen outside? Um, so we would recommend that if you're keeping children inside a year group, that you keep that year group as separate as possible from other year groups. So the extension of being allowed to have a whole year group mixing allows for, for example, uh, children in GCSE and A-level years to be taking different sets of subjects. But because the whole year group is being considered as a segmented group, you don't have to worry about them intermixing with different choices. It does mean that you will need to keep the year groups separate to a certain extent in order to be able to keep some chain breaks in the transmission. And these are kind of the same as a fire break in a forest fire. Um, you need to be able to separate them enough so that if there is um, a, an infection in the community or a, an incident that affects the school population, you don't have to take the whole school back to a, a, a virtual teaching scenario. I just noticed one quick question in the chat that I wanted to answer to. Somebody, uh, Ruby Norman said, my school were given three antibody tests. All three came back positive, whereas other schools were mostly negative. Why aren't our school now being prioritized for testing? Um, and I just want to highlight that one of the things about an antibody test 
not a PCR test. So whereas a, a PCR test, a real-time polymerase chain reaction, you don't need to know the, the details, the antigen test, the swab, uh, gives you an idea of whether you have the virus now. The antibody test tells you whether you've had the virus before. Now, the likelihood is that you've had the virus before during a period not associated with transmission in school. And the two infections that we've seen so far actively within teachers have been traced to contacts outside of school. So an antibody test positive doesn't mean that there are active cases in your school. It means that the people have had it at some point before, up to six months ago. Um, and there's no cause for alarm. Sorry, I'll let you pass to the Minister now. No, thank you very much for picking up on that. Um, so, Minister for Education, Kirsty Williams, are you uh, able to join us? Hello, thank you for coming no, in. My, uh, no, my sincere, my sincere apologies. I was actually at a school um, with the First Minister, so um, my sincere apologies in, uh, um, in not being here at the start of the, of the meeting. I hope Fliss has been able to uh, answer people's um, uh, questions. Yes, thank you. We've had the opportunity to hear from her. We've had a few questions. So um, if you're happy to um, take, take the uh, microphone, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just want to say a massive thank you once again uh, for being um, able to, to join this evening. It's, um, uh, I hope uh, as we come to the uh, end of uh, three weeks for most schools and uh, a few local authorities being the four weeks, uh, that, uh, that they've been a positive experience. Certainly the school I've just come from, uh, talking to some of the students, some of the staff, uh, they found that the last um, two and a half weeks have been really, really valuable. Uh, and are now uh, looking forward and working hard on plans for uh, September. Uh, I hope uh, that, the, um, that the guidance we were able to publish uh, yesterday, and that's been through a period of consultation with, um, all, with all the, the unions, um, answers some of your uh, questions. But I just think it's really important to, to bear in mind that um, uh, even in the weeks between now and September, uh, you know, obviously we'll need to keep on checking in with regards to community transmission rates, uh, that's absolutely crucial uh, that we keep those transmission rates uh, low uh, because it's that that's allowed us to make the decision uh, to uh, return uh, to school. Uh, there are uh, clearly uh, ongoing work with regards to school transport uh, and working with local authorities and the transport division to um, uh, ensure that transport uh, is, runs smoothly at the start of term. And I know that sometimes there are questions about um, advice to individual members of staff who may have been shielding or who may have been classed as having an underlying condition that makes them um, more, uh, more vulnerable and that's expected to change over the summer as well. So the document that was published yesterday is, is, um, is uh, what we know now uh, but I've given a commitment that we will continue to work with uh, rep um, union representatives uh, over the summer to make sure that that keeps updated. Uh, and reflects the very latest advice, both in transport, um, more generally in public health, and that we keep the R number under under review. But with that, I'm quite happy to take um, to take questions. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, bear with me one moment. Sorry, I'm just trying to. Uh, this is uh, wanting to get us all back on the screen. That's not quite going to plan for me. Right, thank you. I know that you've had some of the questions in advance, um, Minister, so I'm just going to, to run through those ones first of all, and then we'll visit some of the ones that have been submitted while the event's been taking place. Um, and I have to point out, actually, I should have done this um, at the start, that some of these questions were actually submitted before the guidance was published, uh, so, so it may be that, you know, it's going to be covered within, within what's, already been, um, what's already come out, but um, just to make reference to that. So these, this question um, has been directed to the Minister from Tim Newbold. Um, it asks, in terms of the extra funding for catch-up, how will the funding be allocated? Will the minister ensure that it is passported efficiently to schools rather than a complex bidding process via consortia? Sorry, you're on mute. Thank you for that, for, uh, that really important question. Uh, we're working through the details of how we can get that money out uh, as quickly as possible. We wanted to make the announcement on the money as soon as we had clearance uh, from the finance minister. The process in the uh, government means that we put an application in to the finance minister for additional resources. Uh, the 29 million uh, is 
uh, approximately uh, uh, the consequential that we received as a result of the English announcement. Uh, so the English, uh, the Westminster government said that we would receive up to uh, 30 million pounds in this financial year. So we've been able to secure that money. Uh, we're now working uh, to find the most equitable way of getting that money out. But I absolutely take the point um, my preference is for that money to go directly to schools and not to have step, stepping off points either at consortia level or at the local authority level. So we're just trying to find the most efficient way that we can get that money out as quickly as possible uh, and absolutely uh, looking to avoid any complex uh, bidding process that would require lots of form filling uh, or, or, or the potential for the money to get stuck somewhere which isn't in the school budget. Thank you. Um, now, this question was directed to um, the Minister, but it's from someone called Sharon A. It may be that um, Felicity, you may be able to help on this as well. Um, following the ease of lockdown in England, the R rate has risen there, and yet we seem to be following the same courses of action if a few weeks behind. Why is that? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure Fliss will chip in. I think what's really important to recognise is that uh, we have had a very um, cautious approach, approach here in Wales, which has allowed us to monitor the impact on community transmission every time an aspect of lockdown has, uh, has been uh, uh, unlocked. Uh, low community transmission, as I said earlier, is absolutely the key to getting children back, uh, back into school. Uh, and that's going to need an effort, a continuing effort throughout the summer and a responsibility on all of us uh, to keep the R rate down. So there's things that we can ask practitioners to do in the school, but actually it's the actions of all of us and the members and the public in general outside of school that is going to create the safest conditions to get to get children to get children back. Uh, so our, our, despite the easing of our lockdown, R remains uh, at an acceptable level. Uh, we've seen over the last week, the first days since March where we have had no recorded deaths uh, in Wales, We've seen infection levels uh, low enough so that our TTP system can step in, isolate and get on top of those infections quickly. Uh, so even when we've had a, re a relatively um, uh, large outbreak, the TTP system has been able to respond very positively. And if you've read the TAC paper, then obviously a, a highly efficient um, uh, uh, TTP system is again absolutely crucial to underpin the decision that we've made. And at the moment, the TTP um, uh, system is performing at the levels that can give us confidence. But Fliss, I don't know if there's um, anything um, I should have add, added, but you know, I think it's just really important, uh, you know, that we give the message to the general public, not just not to the just the teachers, that if people want schools open in September, then we've all in our personal lives got to behave responsibly. You know, we've got to keep the social distancing. We've got to continue uh, to take the advice and do everything that's right because if we do that the community transmission rate will, will remain low and that's what makes it safe. Thank you. Was there anything? Um, yes, there is. And uh, apologies, Sorry, to the, uh, apologies to the um, maths teachers among you. Um, one of the things about the R number and one of the reasons why as we come to the end of a wave of infection it becomes less useful is because R is not technically a rate uh, and it's the minister like so many others probably absolutely sick of me saying don't call it the R rate please oh please sorry um, that's, that's quite all right uh, it's because it's a uh, it, it, it's actually a ratio it's more like a quadratic equation showing the rate of change uh, over time and the thing about that is as I'm sure you recall when the uh, there we go when the R naught the original exponential curve rise goes up like that. And R0 was about 3, 3.5. And as we started to mitigate, it started to flatten out. And we had R is 2, R is 1.5. And the point at which it was a flat line, R was 1. And then RT began to drop as we did more things. R is 0 0.9, 0 0.8. When R is 0 0.5, it's dropping very fast. But as the number of cases starts to get smaller, that number flattens out because you can't actually go down below zero uh, cases in the population. Um, so when you hit zero cases, R tends towards one again. What that means is that by the time we get to the point where we have very few cases, but they're still going, A, the noise that comes from it not being a perfect number of people who get infected, 
and the fact that we're really only talking about the actual gradient of the line rather than what's happening. The effect is that R will always tend towards one when you eliminate an infection, because if you're exchanging no infections for no infections every day, you have a, a horizontal gradient. So whatever we do at this point, if we are getting rid of the disease, R will start creeping back towards one. But if we measure it alongside the growth rate, alongside the incidence and the prevalence, and if we measure it alongside the difference between community uh, infection, which we don't control, and incidence, which we can control and stop them from becoming outbreaks, then there is no danger, more danger from COVID than there is from any other disease that's chronic in this country. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to actually jump to one of the questions that's been submitted while we've been broadcasting. Um, this has been submitted and there's actually nearly 50 people who would like me to ask you this question, Minister. Um, it specifically, it says, can you please confirm that if planning days are taken at the start of term, they will not be taken from our six inset days? Uh, yes, very happy to confirm that. Um, but we hope that where at all possible, uh, schools will begin normal operations uh, at the very beginning of term. Uh, but we recognise that some schools uh, uh, need to plan, uh, need more time to plan. So we uh, are recognising that over the first two week period, there may be a gradual build up. Uh, but uh, uh, but that's, that, that is not instead of uh, 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 inset days. But, you know, clearly we want to maximise, don't we? Uh, children have lost a lot of time uh, and I hope that we can, you know, wherever possible, maximise uh, the opportunity to have children in, in front of the classroom. Thank you. Um, and the next question was addressed to um, Felicity. It says, what measures should be considered for pupils who cannot socially distance from the teacher or adults, for example, children with SEN? Children from SEN is a, is, is a really good um, example of why it's important to consider segregation of a, a group of adults with a group of children. So depending on the age of the child, we know that there's a significantly lower transmission rate uh, to and from children, uh, but there will of course be a, a higher risk. So if there is a child who is particularly vulnerable and if there are a, a number of carers who need to interact with a child who uh, cannot be segregated in their other parts of their work, then it would be appropriate for them to use a pro personal protective equipment when looking after the child. Obviously, you need to consider whether or not that's going to cause a degree of distress. Um, if you're supporting children, for instance, who have hearing difficulties, then they're going to need to be able to see your lips move if they're lip readers. And, and that's going to prevent you from being able to wear full face masking. The decision of whether to segregate, or I don't like to use this word, but bubble uh, some adults together with some children in order to benefit all, uh, or whether to use protective equipment is down to a school by school decision. Thank you. Um, right, I'm going to come back to another question which has actually been submitted, a very popular question, 34 people, um, question submitted by James Llewellyn for the Minister. Why haven't schools been given the opportunity to close for a minimum half day a week to allow for cleaning, given the significant increase in the numbers of pupils who are going to be attending? This would have also allowed for PPA to be covered, especially given the potential for fewer members of staff available in September. Sorry, you're on mute again. What we're, what we're trying to do is uh, to minimise the disruption to children going forward uh, and to uh, maximise the amount of time that they can spend in school. So appreciate uh, that that does mean that uh, enhanced cleaning regimes uh, 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 will certainly take longer. But um, as I said, you know, we're hoping uh, that we can uh, address those uh, without having a Im continuing impact on children's education given the uh, amount of time that they have uh, that they have already uh, that they've already uh, missed and that's the priority i'm sure for everybody now is to you know maximize that face to face time and to try and uh, work around that with regards to the availability of staff um, i'm assume that is i, I assume uh, that that is relating to perhaps uh, staff who are currently shielding uh, we're expecting um, uh, further advice on, she on members of the public that are shielding uh, at the end of July, the beginning of August. Uh, and although I don't want to uh, 
uh, anticipate that, that what that will say, but uh, we do expect that that will uh, again uh, allow uh, members of staff uh, who at this point would be advised not to go back to school to be able to go back uh, to go back to work. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, for the, for the minister, this is a question from um, Pauline. Twenty-six people have voted for this question. When can we expect the guidance for nursery education, please? Uh, so uh, the uh, the general principles uh, for nursery are uh, uh, apply to the, the guidance we published yesterday. Uh, generally apply uh, to nursery, and my colleague uh, Julie uh, Morgan, who uh, has responsibility for um, childcare and preschool, uh, will be working with that sector to uh, to open up. If there are specific uh, concerns around nursery that uh, that the current guidance does not address, we can uh, supply additional uh, additional guidance uh, as quickly as possible in conjunction with Julie Morgan, who is the minister responsible for childcare settings. So that needs that's two parts of the government that need to work together uh, on that, and we'll get that out as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, do, do you anticipate that it might be uh, before the end of term? Obviously, bearing in mind there's just a few days to go. Uh, I'm not completely in control of that process because it does require the other minister to have and, and, uh, and that policy area to have some impact uh, input. Uh, I'm very keen to, to get it out. It will probably be out before the end of the month rather than the end of the term. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Brian Griffiths. 29 people have um, voted on this question. Are breakfast clubs and after school clubs expected to open immediately or will they be phased in? Uh, uh, again, um, we'd like things, we'd like operations to return as quickly to normal as quickly uh, as possible. But again, recognise that additional planning time may be uh, needed to, to to make that happen. So our expectation is that uh, the priority should be a return to uh, schooling, uh, and then uh, services uh, at the beginning uh, before the beginning of the school day and the end of the school day can be phased in. Uh, but you know, obviously. That, that's of a huge benefit to, to, to families. Uh, so the quicker that can be done, the better. But the priority uh, for September initially should be a return to school and then building up to the services that would wrap around um, a, a school uh, usually. OK, thank you for that. Um, this next question was submitted in advance by Sean Smith and it was addressed to Felicity. Um, it asks, are you comfortable with all secondary school pupils returning for all lessons in September as it contradicts your guidance? I'd be interested to understand the uh, way in which it contradicts the guidance. Um, I can only imagine it might be to do with the size of the classrooms and the social distancing. I mean, okay, I yeah. So there are inevitably going to be differences. I am very comfortable with the fact that the risk is significantly low at the moment. I also know that there is, uh, cannot say there is 100% certainty, but every uh, virus and every epidemic and every pandemic that I've studied has come back for a second wave, uh, which has been uh, more widely seeded, meaning there are more people to, to start to spread it. And usually uh, at a time of winter when people are sick with other diseases, and I cannot see how coronavirus would be any different, even if it is not seasonal. It there will almost certainly be further incidents. And as we come into winter, as people get cold and it gets dark, we know that the coronavirus far prefers cold and dark. Um, the sunlight and the outdoors kills it very quickly, but it lasts for a long time indoors. Um, you know, there are going to be incidents and there are going to be outbreaks. And those are going to affect uh, people and they are going to affect children, although hopefully very, very few. So, um, what we can try and do is put into place a system which allows people to understand enough as much as we know about the virus and feel comfortable as much as they can in what their mitigations are so that when we say it's likely that there are going to be more cases in your area soon or there are more cases in your area now then those schools in that area can work with the local authorities in the local resilience fora to say okay we're going to step up to the next alert level. Maybe we're going to increase hand hygiene. 
maybe we're going to start saying that children need to get ready to have some time at home and we'll do part virtual and part teaching uh, in school lessons. Um, it's going to need to be able to be based on what's right for the head teacher in the school and, and the pupils. Um, there will be outbreaks and I expect over the next six months almost every school will at some point have to go fully back to um, you know the two meter distancing so I don't think any of the planning that they've done to date is really going to be wasted I think it's going to be needed um, the aim of everything that we're doing and, and all of the research that we're studying is to try and prevent us from having to go back to the the dreadful kind of full country lockdown that's going to be so damaging to our society and our children my kids well my kids are absolutely sick of me they're six and eight years old and frankly they've had enough um, but children uh, need to learn and need to be with other people and what we've started to find is that if you balance the risk of them losing out on so much education especially in secondary school when they need to be starting to think about what the next steps in their hopefully long and very wonderful lives are going to be um, the risk of them not being able to do that I think is greater than what seems to be an increasingly minor risk of them suffering from coronavirus. Okay thank you. For that. Um, so the next question I'm going to bring in it kind of touched on um, home learning and the situation around that so this question has been submitted by Melanie Evans and there are 43 people who would like it to be asked of the minister um, and I know this is talked about slightly in, in the guidance as well, but just to, to bring in the question, how can our teachers commit to home learning when teaching full time and to full capacity? Uh, so um, what we're asking uh, to do uh, is to uh, return to as normal a situation uh, as we can in September, recognising all the very uh, significant logistical challenges around that. Uh, but if we can get all the children back in, uh, then uh, the need to do distance learning at that point is dis diminished. But as we've just heard uh, from uh, Fliss, we, we need to uh, be in a position to switch if necessary. Now, um, we had to switch very quickly in an emergency situation. And uh, if we're honest, if we're all being honest and candid in this meeting, um, some individual professionals have managed that change better than others. Some schools have been able to make that switch more successfully uh, than others. Uh, and that's not surprising because nobody had planned for the situation that they found themselves in. Uh, and I think uh, overall, uh, the collective effort has been, um, uh, has been exceptional given the emergency situation we found ourselves in. Uh, we also know that families are in a different position to be active recipients uh, of that learning uh, as well. And those are circumstances beyond the control. Uh, often of professionals and the government has tried to take steps to to address that but what we're asking schools to do is to be as prepared as they can be if necessary to switch back to that uh, to switch back to that model uh, and and be uh, and be prepared for that because as Fliss said we could find ourselves in a situation where perhaps an individual year group uh, uh, finds themselves at home or we could end up in a situation if we have an outbreak in the community where we may ask that school to move to uh, a situation that is more to, akin to what we've experienced after the, the last three weeks to minimise the number of children in school. Or we could ask, have to ask the school to close like they did in Leicestershire recently when there was a community outbreak there. Uh, so that's what we're asking uh, teachers to do and schools to do is to, to be able to, rather than do it in an emergency, uh, plan have a plan in place of how you can move to that situation should you should you re require should you be required to, to do that uh, the, the autumn term is going to not going to be a simple one it would be remiss of me to sit here and say as we head into the winter that uh, that things will be simple but uh, if we can be prepared ourselves for, the, for a situation where a year group or an individual school has to close again then uh, being prepared for that, having a plan for that, and being able to operationalize that plan quickly will help us minimize the disruption to children. Thank you. Thank you. This question was submitted earlier. This was um, from Jarmin Beasley. This is a more specific question again. Um, some of the pupils with whom we work can be very violent, and occasionally we have to undertake positive handling to keep everyone safe, which is always a last resort. 
How can I ensure the safety of the staff if positive handling is required? Sorry. Is that to me or to the minister? Sorry. I, well, I, I, go on, Fliz. You, you yeah. go first and then I'll pick it up. <laughs> it's, it, you're right, it's so difficult when uh, children or, or anybody with um, needs that are so extreme that you need to be able to protect them from themselves as well as from everybody else. And, you know, one can't wear PPE all the time just to assume that. I think in those sorts of situations, you need to be able to work out uh, which members of staff are likely to need to buddy up with them. I think although children perhaps at the age of 16 or 17, you're starting to get into more, uh, trans more high transmission territory, certainly children from 12, 14 years old and under, the likelihood is that the minimal time that you will need to spend in the place of physically restraining a child or, or working to support them into a into a calmer place actually carries a very low risk of exposure so the risk of exposure to coronavirus is a factor of proximity and time and one of the ways that you could for instance protect a member of staff from having the virus transmitted uh, even if they were an older child would be to try and make sure that you weren't being breathed on directly by them and, and perhaps work out how you might be able to both be facing in the same direction or to face away so that you weren't taking in airborne particles. Thank you. Minister, is there anything you wanted to uh, I just think, you know, these, these are challenging situa situations uh, 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 and to try and adapt to that uh, is, uh, is difficult. Uh, the alternative is to uh, not educate those children, which I know is not acceptable to members uh, on this call. And again, it does come back to community transmission rates uh, and, a and a balance of risk. Uh, and while com community transmission rates are low, the chances of that individual child who is, uh, who is proving challenging and has to be restrained is probably very, very low. Combined with that then, that, that if that child, as Fliss said, is under is, is a younger child, again, the, the, the teacher is probably, goodness me, the adult is probably more of a risk to the child than the child is to the adult. So I think we just need to balance all of these things up. It is scary uh, and it is uh, concerning, I know, to professionals, uh, but with community transmission rates as low as they are, then we just have to balance the risks of, uh, of of, of being back in the classroom uh, with all of our children, as opposed to uh, the risks of uh, what those the, the risks of those children posing to one another, and the risks of the, the risks those children may or may not pose uh, to adult members of uh, staff. But you know, we're taking those choices in our lives all the time, aren't we? You know, where you know, uh, and we have to you know eliminate those risks as much as possible. But it would be, but it's not. I've always said this: it is impossible to create a risk-free environment. It's impossible Minister, to do that. Also, if they're just looking at Ian Elliott's comment, if if they're a spitter, um, a, a very cheap and easy way to to reduce the transmission risk would be to have a uh, a plastic visor nearby, which you can just pop on in seconds as you go to uh, work with the child. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this question has been submitted throughout the, the broadcast by Jane. There are twenty two people who'd like it asked. Um, due to the amount of cleaning required in September and the children in their class bubbles, our head teacher has said that we can't expect an hour dinner break. Is there a set time for what teachers are entitled to? If we're expected to teach 30 children in the curriculum, half an hour is not enough time to eat and prepare. Our job is not to carry out cleaning and supervise dinners. That's for the minister, please. Uh, well, those are, those are employment issues which will have to be sorted out at a local uh, level we don't want to we don't want to treat people un unfairly uh, but um uh, and we would want people to uh, make sure that staff well-being is being attended to uh, during this period uh, but um i can't uh, uh that's a conversation that uh, an individual member of staff will need to have with their local employer about reasonable expectations. Thank you. Also, I can't see a huge amount of value in, in cleaning in the middle of the day. Um, 
beyond uh, the sort of usual wipe downs and stuff. Really, it's better to teach the children as well as any members of staff who are there to learn to, to wipe after themselves. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I can think of possibly one example, uh, perhaps if there was a nursery class where children attend in the morning and in the afternoon, um, as, as a practical example. Um, anyway, okay, this next question is moving away from kind of practical advice question. Um, this is uh, from Richard Hughes. This is for the Minister. Um, have negotiations continued with unions to enable a more flexible response to a resurgence of cases of COVID-19? That is, to have the ability to adjust term times at short notice, for example. Uh, yeah, well, um, to be honest, after my previ ex previous experience, I'm a little reluctant to go anywhere near the issue of term, uh, term times, uh, given uh, how difficult uh, this has proven to be, either that is with regards to an August start uh, to this academic year, or to look to um, amend uh, term times. People obviously regard uh, their terms and conditions very uh, valuably, uh, as, as, as unrightly so. Uh, so um, you know, uh, to be honest, um, given the lack of appetite for uh, changing term times previously uh, during this outbreak, um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of frustration, a lot of discussion for not a lot of result in the end. Uh, but um, clearly, if that was necessary, we would have to go there again. But um, uh, I think uh, there has been um, uh, the union leadership, uh, and I'm not saying it's this union, but uh, union leadership seems to uh, believe that uh, any discussion around uh, changes to term dates is, is not one that they that they want to get engaged with. But um, as I said, if we need to, we will we will try again. Thank you. Um, I would like to say actually as well before we put this last question to um, to the minister that um, any questions that haven't had an opportunity to actually be addressed, we will make sure that we we feed them into our policy and look at the, the, you know whether we can help that, um, answer some of those with our with our FAQs for example. Um, but this final question for you, minister, is from Chris Newcomb. The last few months have been an unprecedented experience for everyone, and our education family has risen to the challenge admirably. Upon reflection. Do you think that the experiences gained and the new and innovative ways of operating will positively change education in Wales going forward? And if so, how? Uh, well, I think I absolutely agree with that analysis. It has been an incredibly challenging uh, time. And I also agree that, uh, that teachers and support staff and youth workers and all of those in Wales that have an interest in the well-being of children have gone above and beyond in supporting children at this time. The innovation that has been on display has been amazing. Uh, the pace at which professionals have been able to work has been amazing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think um, what I've been trying to do uh, in amongst all of this is uh, to, uh, to look at that innovation and good practice and to see how we can mainstream some of that into the education system as we go, as we go forward. Uh, if we take if we take blended learning actually and remote learning, um, for many it, that has been a struggle. But there are parts of the cohort for whom that has actually been very liberating and very empowering. Uh, and if we could mainstream some of that into practice going forward, that would be very welcome. As I said, I've just come I've just come from a, a school visit. Uh, the school I was at has actually been acting as the uh, childcare hub throughout uh, this uh, period. As a result of the conversations of those staff working with head teachers in other schools, uh, a plan has emerged where that secondary school will now share its modern foreign language resources and teachers to work in their feeder primary schools. Uh, and that has come from, you know, conversations that have been had as they uh, work together to deliver that hub uh, provision uh, and there are lots of examples like that of 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 of, of head school leaders who've been working collectively together to take uh, what what good we can out of this uh, situation um, and uh, and of course we all want to return to normal but we also have to recognize you know are we sure that normal was good enough uh, and uh, are there this period of disruption does that allow us uh, you know to bring in some of the innovation and the learning but i think most of all i hope it gives the general public 
uh, a better appreciation of what the profession does, uh, what a difficult and challenging but rewarding job it is to be a teacher. And I hope that there is, we can hang on to that newfound respect I think that many parents will have uh, for the profession as we go forward. And that will lead to better relationships between parents and schools where perhaps that needs to improve because parents now understand what a challenging job that it uh, is. But I think it should also give us confidence that we can innovate, we can do things at pace, and we can respond really, really positively and quickly. Because sometimes, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think we back ourselves enough in Wales to make, uh, to make th things happen. And we've demonstrated uniquely in the United Kingdom in these last three weeks what we can do. Uh, and the can-do attitude of the profession has been, has been amazing. And I hope that gives us confidence that we can continue to back teachers, we can back ourselves, and we can do things uh, that are really, truly innovative. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for, for that, that um, closing comment. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to Felicity Benet for joining us as well. We're going to close to hearing from um, the president of NAHT, Ruth Davis. Hello, hi. Really good to have spent some time with you again. Um, and Minister, thank you for, um, we've collectively praised the workforce, which has proved itself, I think you'd agree, over the last few months, not just capable and skillful and solution focused and highly adaptable, but compassionate too. Much has been spoken in the last few months of the life chances of this generation of learners, and I'm sure you'll agree that school leaders have placed themselves right at the heart of the plans needed to save these very chances that have concerned us. They've been seen to repeatedly place themselves on the line when it comes to tough decision making, decisions which have often put themselves at personal risk. Um, they've not just managed their teams, but they've cared for them as well. They've shouldered responsibility, not just for their learners, but for their learners' families too. School leaders and their terrific teams have quite literally held our communities together. And so before I draw this evening's discussions formally to a close, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank every single one of you. To thank you for a sustained effort, which has been nothing short of phenomenal. And to ask you to take a moment to reflect on what our communities would be looking like today if school leaders hadn't stepped up and achieved what you have done. NHT, we'd like to thank you too, Minister, for your willingness to engage, to listen and to act through what must surely be some of the most demanding periods of any of our careers. Unprecedented times sadly don't come with rule books. They call for creative approaches to decision making and sometimes those creative approaches immediately yield the results that we would wish for, but sometimes they don't. And the important thing to remember here is how much we can learn from the things that don't go according to plan. And this, I believe, needs to be the basis from which we all approach September. There have been many approaches we've agreed upon since March and some we've disagreed on. But what has held us together is our joint commitment to the learner. And so I, I thank you for this as well, Minister, for making sure that the learner's voice is right there at the heart of all the decisions made on their behalf this is the way we endeavour to run our schools and so it is always reassuring to observe national policy being made in a similar vein. Wales indeed has much to be proud of in this respect. Um, so as I say we so often learn as much if not more from the plans that don't immediately work out as from the ones that do and the need for problem solving our way to safe arrangements didn't end with the publication of the guidance yesterday. That was where the next stage began. If we're going to mitigate the impact this crisis might otherwise have on a generation of learners, we must begin September with a renewed determination to continue to both speak with and listen to each other. We'll have plans that work out and others that don't. But in all of this, school leaders must know what it feels like to be supported by their local administrations as well as by national government. In working to solutions, they will sometimes need to take measured risks and they need to be praised for the progress made, not blamed for the errors that will undoubtedly occur as well. 
If we can achieve this level of trust and true partnership, then we will surely have secured the best conditions under which our collective next steps uh, can, can progress. When you made your announcement last week, Kirsty, you clearly set out your aspirations for return plans, which were at once safe and sensible ones. While we may still have questions to think through and answers that require yet more clarity and plans B, C and D to refine, I think you'll agree that once again our webinar this evening has demonstrated the immense commitment of a profession we're all so proud to be part of. It's demonstrated a keen can-do attitude, a determination to get this right for our lovely learners and a skill base which appears to know no end. We don't know what September will yet look like or what further unexpected curveballs the new academic year uh, has yet to throw at us. But this we do know, that our schools and learning settings are in safe hands. So once again, thank you to every single one of you. I truly hope that one of your safe and sensible plans for the coming weeks is a period of serious downtime. Recovery time is much needed. And you shouldn't feel the need to justify this in any way whatsoever. There is much we don't know about September, but one thing we can be sure of is that it will herald the start of a demanding term. The safest and more sensible plan is to approach it rested and repaired. I sincerely hope each and every one of you will enjoy every minute of your break and trust me, it's a well-earned one. So, Minister, colleagues, once again, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very Good much. Words. Thank you. Um, and before we finish, um, I would really, you know, want to make sure to reiterate on behalf of the union as well, what Ruth has just said, you know, everyone has, all of you have worked absolutely tirelessly, tirelessly throughout this pandemic, and it is going to be a difficult autumn term, um, whatever it may bring, it's, it's not going to be an easy one. So please do make sure that you do get that rest over the summer holiday as much as possible. Um, we won't be communicating any more than is you know, necessary um, from the union. We've had lots of communication from us, uh, but we're going to reduce what we put out to you as necessary. Um, you know, we don't anticipate any big announcements, any significant developments. If there are any, of course, we'll be in touch. But we are all here for you. If you should need us, please don't hesitate to contact us for support as well. Um, and before we finish, I would just like to say this broadcast is obviously specific to NAHT Cymru and we've had several Wales specific broadcasts, but we've also been throughout the last few months um, carrying out lots of online briefings, which we, would, we do plan to continue as a union um, in, the, in the autumn term. But our final one that we have scheduled for this term may be of interest to you. It's um, av available on Crowdcast. It's on Thursday evening at 7pm entitled COVID-19, the impact on the BAME community, how to support your staff and pupils. So I'd encourage you uh, to, to register for that. You can find the link in the chat or also through our website. So again, thank you very much. Just to say, please make sure you do have that rest. Thank you so much to all our speakers for joining us. Thank you to all of the audience for joining us today. Dioch and goodbye. <laughs>